Welcome to More Please. I'm Robin Ray, and today we have the pleasure of diving deep into the menu of Stofa Restaurant. Head chef and owner Jason Sawizian has created approachable fine dining in a warm and relaxed setting, serving contemporary Canadian cuisine with fresh and local ingredients in an eclectic part of the city. In 2017, Stofa was chosen as one of Canada's 100 best restaurants by a prestigious panel of national and local judges. They've also been featured in many notable magazines and media outlets, including Chatelaine magazine, as one of the hottest spots to dine in Canada's capital. With a 40-seat dining area designed by Ulya Jensen Interiors, Stofa boasts a comfortable, contemporary vibe and also includes a big bar, enough for dining and drinks, as well as a private 16-person seating area upstairs and a spacious porch area for outdoor dining, also an extended patio on the boulevard. Alongside Jason is sous chef Catherine Ferries, North American winner of the S. Pellegrino Award for Social Responsibility, who has been selected to star in the S. Pellegrino Young Chef Cookbook. Tell me a little bit about the restaurant and how it came to be, how it got its name. Yeah, so Stofa is a place where we wanted to design it so people could come and be with friends, family. Um, we kind of coined a, um, a phrase, approachable fine dining. So when you come here, you should expect some really great food, great atmosphere, but it's also very approachable for anybody who wants to come. Um, the name we got from, it's an old English word, word which means um, like a hearth or the, the heating source of a center of a room. And that was typically the place where like people came to gather with family and friends. So that was kind of the basis for the restaurant's name. So what do you want people to take away or experience when they come to dine here? Yeah, so like I said, we make kind of approachable fine dining. So a lot of the um, items on the menu will be recognizable, but we always like to throw in some kind of twist. We use a lot of ingredients from around the world within our cooking. So I think people like the uniqueness of our style and um, the, really the nice plating that's involved as well. Okay, now I'm intrigued. Ingredients from around the world. Can you give us an idea of what kind of unique things we could see on the menu? I mean, we use a lot of um, ingredients from Asia, different parts of Asia, Japan, Thailand. Um, we've gone to Eastern Europe. We get a lot of influences from South America right now. Um, Spain's a big one too, so we like to bounce around. Um, we definitely use and focus our menu around local ingredients in terms of produce and our proteins, but we like to add those kind of like little flares of um, uniqueness, I guess, from around the world. Okay, and tell me about how COVID has changed things for you um, yeah. and the experience. Yeah, I guess um, when COVID first hit, there wasn't much restaurants could do other than takeout, and our takeout plan is a bit different than a lot of the restaurants, so we offer uh, take-home meals for four, and that's been the route we've kept the whole time. Um, it is not the same kind of food or experience as you would get in the restaurant, and we did that um, on purpose. Um, we didn't feel like our food could translate well in a takeout setting, and we didn't want to kind of have the food suffer in, in that, that way. Um, so we've created, we created a whole new takeout dynamic for, for, pe for people to come in and get. Um, and as, I guess, COVID has progressed, we've done a lot of different things besides the takeout. We had an outdoor market one weekend, which went really well, and we've expanded our patio. So um, with every new kind of like development that COVID brings, we kind of change our direction slightly, but I think the key elements of our business and the restaurant have kind of stayed intact. We are back in the kitchen at Stofa. Chef Jason, where are we starting? So we're just gonna start uh, first with some fried items that we put on the pork belly dish. These are uh, nori rice cakes. 
So it's Japanese rice cooked with a little bit of nori and then cut into these little cakes. And we're gonna toss them in these rice pearls. So they get rice a little- pearls. Yeah, they get a little bit of a coating and those will fry up a bit. And just get those ready for the dish. The dish has a bit of an Asian feel to it and this is a nice complement to the fattiness of the pork belly. So that's it, that's what we're looking for. You can see those little rice pearls got a little golden brown. The next thing we're doing, we're just gonna puff some rice noodles as a garnish. Just take a couple seconds to puff up. Do you find that you're experimenting back here often <laughs> with new things? Yeah, yeah, we, I mean, I think all the chefs in the kitchen right now, if they um, see something interesting, they just buy it and we bring it in and we all try it out and we see kind of how that might work into the menu or if we can create a dish around it. All right, so that's done. Okay, next step, what do we got here? So this is the 24 hour pork belly that we sous vide at um, 65 degrees and we'll just slice into it, trim the outside off. And we'll just sear them up really quickly. Takes a couple of minutes each side, but I uh, want to render some of the fat out. Just have a nice golden color on it. The sous vide cooking really makes it tender. Um, and then we just crisp it up for a nice texture contrast. Oh, that smells so right. good. I wish you could smell this on camera, because. <laughs> and the next step is we glaze it with a little hoisin and oyster sauce. So that just goes on the top there. And the next thing we're gonna do is make our uh, kimchi salad. So this is house-made kimchi, we make it in-house. It's basically Napa cabbage, some uh, turnip, Korean chilies, shrimp paste, and garlic, ginger, green onions. And then you just let it ferment at kind of room temperature until it's done. And then we vacuum seal it and keep it in our fridge. So it's some of that, some uh, good amount of green onions. And we're just gonna mandolin a bit of fresh apple in there as well. So it'll have a little bit of a kick to it, but also yep, exactly. sweet it's supposed from to be the apple. Sweet, spicy, and to go along with the pork belly, very refreshing. The kimchi uh, is great. I mean, lots of people love it. It's so versatile, actually. You can cook with it. You can eat it kind of as is. You can mix it into things. So, and now we'll start plating. So this is a black sesame paste that we make. It's black sesame is blitzed in with oil and some salt. Then we'll plate the pork belly. This part is an art. Then we have our rice cakes that we made earlier, just off to the side there. Put our kimchi slaw kind of laid over top. These are uh, little peppers that we pickle. Oh, interesting. Yeah, they're, they look spicy, but they're actually sweet. Okay, nice color pop. Exactly. These are uh, called woodier mushrooms. We get them dry, they're available in Chinatown and um, we marinate them in a ponzu sauce, which we make in-house, which is essentially some soy, maple, uh, star anise, and some sugar. And then I just toss it with some toasted sesame seeds. This yeah, is a, a, a black vinegar mayonnaise. And that sort of goes well with the whole dish? or specific? Exactly, yeah. The, the pork belly is rich, but adds a little more richness to it. Right. And um, got some of this, it's called blood sorrel. Very pretty stuff, got a nice tang to it. Couple of those on the plate. And then finally, just to finish it off, our crispy rice noodle just kind of goes on top. And there you go. It looks like art. It's beautiful. That's our uh, pork belly dish on the menu right now. Dish number two, Jason, I have a feeling this one is going to be right up my alley. So what are we making now? Yeah, so it's our seared scallop dish with um, a nuja corn bean succotash. Um, these are uh, Canadian scallops. We'll start by scoring the tops. This is kind of unique. We do it for a couple of factors. Looks really nice uh, in terms of the presentation when it comes out, but also we are coating them with a sauce, so it allows the sauce to kind of get in the nooks and crannies of where the scores are. So it's kind of multi-purpose, but... Very smart. Yeah. 
And what kind of sauce are we going to be adding to these? It's a salsa verde of sorts. It's okay. kind of our version of it. We make it a bit thicker by adding avocado in it. So right. it kind of sticks to the top of the, uh, of the scallop. Um, so now that we have these scored, we can just move them over here. But we'll start off with the succotash. Okay. And we'll just start off with a tiny, tiny bit of oil. And we're going to take our nuja. Nuja is a spicy fermented kind of sausage. Oh, interesting. Yep. It's very popular right now. It's quite spicy. So we'll just add a tiny bit of that and our onions to start. Get that going. So we want to render a bit of the fat out of the nuja and some of the oil too, because that's going to provide a lot of flavor and a bit of color too. So once we have that going for a couple minutes, we got our corn. Would you say this is a comfort food dish? Uh, it's a great kind of like end of winter dish. So yeah, it is kind of comforty in terms of the succotash, but also fresh because of the scallops. Definitely. And then we, uh, like all succotash, we just finish it with cream and let it reduce a tiny bit. Nice. Let that cook down a bit. Finish it with some green onion. And then we'll reserve that until we plate. While that's reducing, we can get the scallops searing. Nice hot pan. Season our scallops. I love that sound. <laughs> you have to be careful not to overcook scallops, right? Yeah, they can get a bit rubbery. Um, but you do want to make sure you get a nice sear on them. So when you put them in the pan, you want to let them kind of go. You don't want to get too complicated with them. And what do you got there? So we just throw a little thyme into the hot butter. Oh, okay. Flavors the butter. Kind of a restaurant trick. Yeah. And then you just kind of finish the cooking by ladling the butter all over the scallops. And you can see the scoring that we did kind of opens the scallops up a bit. Yeah. They look pretty perfect. And those are done. Excellent. Really quick. All right, next step. The mushrooms that we're putting on the dish, they're maitake mushrooms. Nice kind of very earthy flavor. Yes. And we're frying them in a cornstarch mixture, but it's kind of a salt and pepper mix. Pour a little bit of rice milk in with the mushrooms, and that allows the cornstarch mixture to stick to them. Right, okay. So you just kind of like coat them a bit. Kind of like if you were frying chicken, you'd have it in buttermilk or something like that. Right, yeah. Give them a little, see it's nicely coated. We just Very nice. place it in our fryer. And they get nice and crispy on the edges with that nice salt and pepper flavor. Yeah. So those are done, they don't take long. Okay. And the last thing we're gonna do is actually fry our okra. It kind of, um, whenever you cook okra, it gets really like gummy or slimy. Okay. And when you deep fry, it actually breaks that down and you don't get that. Again, you don't, it's not gonna take a long time. We just fry really quick, kind of like a flash fry. This is um, the salsa verde I was talking about. Yes. Sorry, slather it on top of there. Okay. So to play, we're just gonna put a base of the succotash down, right in there. Scallops go on next. We're gonna plate some about three pieces of the mushrooms. Three pieces of the okra. Very nice. The last thing we're gonna do is just dress a tiny bit of fresh fennel, a little lemon juice, with a tiny bit of simple syrup. I know it seems weird, but it works. <laughs> You're the expert, you would know. <laughs> and then we'll actually just use this to kind of garnish kind of lightly over everything. A lot of there flavors go. going on here. This is fantastic. And then just some uh, micro cilantro to finish it off. Beautiful. There you go. There's our dish. Back in the kitchen with sous chef Catherine Ferries. Hello. So first and foremost, you recently won a pretty prestigious award. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, yeah. So in 2019, I won the San Pellegrino Young Chef uh, Social Responsibility Award. Uh, the dish that I won with was a 
rabbit ballotine with black garlic, white bean puree, vegetables, sort of like radicchio and fennel. It was very seasonal, no waste because I was taking the rabbit, stuffing it with itself, so it was very fun, very fun experience. Very interesting. And because of that, you now have the opportunity to be a part of the Es Pellegrino Young Chef Cookbook. And what we're going to make tonight is actually what dish will be in the cookbook. Is yes. that correct? So the cookbook is a virtual cookbook that's up online. Uh, the dish that I chose was something that home cooks would have access to the ingredients and be able to make, but also sort of incorporate some restaurant techniques. Uh, so I chose buffalo ricotta nudi with uh, smoked ham hock and seasonal vegetables. Uh, the dish that's online is a more springtime, so these vegetables will be a little bit more wintry okay. at the moment. And it feels like uh, ham hock is one of those things that people see in stores and they're unsure of how to cook with, but it's so simple that, you know, I think everyone should at least try it. I guess we're going to find out how right now, aren't we? <laughs> yeah. Okay. First things first. Okay. So first thing I would start with is the ham hock. So for one about this size, you get it like this. It comes pre-smoked, usually wrapped up. You find it in the meat aisle. Uh, for one about this size, it would take about four hours to cook. Wow. But I'm going to get a little broth going. And we're going to start with some spices here. We have some cinnamon, star anise, bay leaf, thyme, some nice aromats that are really going to bring out some more flavors into the ham. I'm going to dice up an onion. Get the onions in there as well. And then I would just pop the ham hock in. You don't have to do anything to it. It cooks on its own and it becomes this most tender, smoky piece of meat. Wow, okay. It comes out looking something like this. It should be fall off the bone tender. And the smell is fantastic. Amazing, <laughs> yes. And I just sort of slice it around the bone. You're gonna get little chunks of meat that come off. And then you're gonna end up pulling the meat and it's gonna end up looking like this. Next up, what I would make is the corn puree. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna blanch your corn. I have a pot of salted water at the back here. Uh, while that's cooking, we can do the pickled pearl onions, which is one of the garnishes. So what I have here is both red wine vinegar and sherry vinegar equal part water. It's gonna cut some of the harshness of the vinegar and make what you're pickling actually palatable. Some salt and sugar. So this is a quick pickle. So all you have to do is just put them in the pot, let them sit in the vinegar for about five, 10 minutes. It takes away some of the harshness of the onions and it really brings out the color. You'll see them turn to this really awesome sort of pink, bright pink color. So my corn is boiling at the back there. So I'm gonna strain it out, get it blended while my vinegar comes up to a boil. I've got some cubed up unsalted butter. Don't use salted butter because it's just going to throw off how much salt's in your dish and then you'll never be able to balance it up. Just add knobs of butter at a time. So I'm just going to strain this. It's going to create like a really smooth puree. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a really nice sauce uh, for the nudies. I'm going to add a little bit of salt. So what's next is my vinegar has come to a boil. I'm going to pour the vinegar over the pearl onions and strain out the aromats on the way so you don't have okay. to pick through any sort of seeds or Can you anything ever smell like that. that. And it smells yes. amazing, but yes. <laughs> it, is, it smells quite strong, but at the end of it, it ends up being quite mild. So up next would be the nudie dough, which is the star of the dish. Right. So, some ricotta. Buffalo milk ricotta is the best. If you can't find that, use regular ricotta and just sort of hang it overnight in your fridge. Okay. It's gonna take out a lot of the extra moisture. Because the more wet your dough is, the more chances it has to fall apart. Right. We're gonna add some double O flour, some breadcrumbs. That's just gonna help it stick together. We're gonna add an egg yolk. We're gonna add our herbs, a little bit of seasoning. So a little bit of nutmeg and a little bit of lemon zest. And then we're gonna add about an ounce of really sharp cheese. So this is a Gouda from Beamster. Uh, you can use anything you'd like, old cheddar, but it does, definitely needs to be like something that you're gonna smell later. Definitely. Cheese. Okay. <laughs> so all you wanna do is just mix it together like a dough. Essentially, you're just looking for something that holds its shape. So you can ball it up and doesn't fall apart. Got it, okay. Sort of press it down a little bit. These are best if you make them 12 to 24 hours in advance. Okay. Gives them a little bit of time for everything to sort of melt together, right. get those flavors together, and it helps um, 
sort of dry out the outside a little bit mm -hmm. so that when you boil them, the water doesn't just completely disintegrate yes. your beautiful work. So I made some yesterday and these are just tossed in a little bit of semolina flour. Uh, and so it just gives a little coating and it makes them a lot more firm. You just need to bring a pot of water to boil. I like to use the stock that you cooked the ham in. Okay, yeah. So it gives you a little extra flavor. You Absolutely. get the saltiness, the smokiness. It really helps bring out a lot of the flavors in the dish. Uh, if you're vegetarian, you obviously can use water, vegetable stock, something like that. Those cook for about two to three minutes. They should float and that's when you know they're done. I'm gonna melt a little bit of butter just to have something to toss them in when they come out. Same as you do with pasta, you know, you put a little bit of oil on, make sure they don't stick together. Right. For our vegetable garnish, I have some red beets, very seasonal. I have some oyster mushrooms, some kohlrabi is a type of radish, oh. uh, and they are very popular during winter time. It's one of the few things that you can really grow in greenhouses at around this time of year and they really take to it. It's kind of how this like funky sort of bitter crunchiness. It's a little different than a regular radish more spicy and then we'll have the pickled onions and the corn and it should be delicious these are gonna come out very gently now give them a little swirl and some butter I tend to very just nice. toss them over oh this looks so good just a little bit of oil in the pan take some beets and some of the mushrooms and we'll heat up the ham hock as well just let those get a little bit of a sear Hit them with more butter. Yeah, and this is the, the artistic part of it. I always appreciate. Because you do, you have to get creative. Yeah, it's amazing to watch how it goes from, you know, a couple pieces of something on a plate and then it, all of a sudden it turns into something yes. beautiful exactly. at the end of it. I really like this dish because you can use any vegetables you like. If you like zucchinis or squashes, there's a lot of versatility I find. A little bit of basil to finish, so it's always nice. And then what we'll do is we'll just pour the corn puree right, right in the middle. Can't forget about that. It's gonna be this delicious buttery sauce once you mix everything together. That's really gonna bring a lot of the flavors together. And, and there it, it is. <laughs> Fantastic. And this is the dish we can find online. Um, you said it was a digital cookbook. Do you have the website for that? Uh, I do. It's at uh, finediningloverscom I do believe. Uh, you should also be able to Google San Pellegrino Young Chef Cookbook, uh, and it should come up. And you'll see a list of about 40 of us who have all submitted beautiful recipes that you can make at home. Well, thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> The moment I have been waiting for. Okay, Jason, first dish here. Get some of the pork belly. That's the uh, best part of the dish. We're going in for the pork belly. That's the mushroom, right? Yeah, it is. Okay, here we go. I love the texture of the mushroom and the ham hock yeah. and the flavors, my goodness. I think it's one of everybody's favorites with pork belly. Seems to be a crowd pleaser. Can't wait to see this in the S. Pellegrino Young Chef cookbook. Oh wow, that didn't, that tastes a little bit different than I thought it would with the sauce, but perfect pairing. Catherine, I promise you, I will learn how to do this. Not nearly as good <laughs> as you, but that is incredible. Thank you guys so much you. for letting me into your kitchen. And we'll see you next time. the Rogers TV viewer response line. Email us or connect with us on social media.